Adore Jesus today. Adore our God. Behold our God. Uh, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the King of kings, Lord of lords. Um, I hope that that means something to you, encourages your spirit as it has mine. All right, we are back in Acts as we are on Sunday nights. And uh, we are in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And so we're teaching, uh, we're going through the book of Acts. We're teaching one sermon out of each chapter. We are by no, you know, no means exhausting the book of Acts here. And uh, we're teaching one sermon out of each chapter. So, and that'll happen for 28 weeks. We have five weeks behind us. We're in week number six. And I've entitled the, uh, I've enti- well, let me do this. In our series on Acts, we have preached one sermon, uh, as I said, chapters one through five. First, the first chapter was keeping the main thing, the main thing. It's about Jesus Christ, folks, and this church right here is about Jesus Christ. And the reason, the reason that the early church exploded as it did was because of power, the power of the Holy Ghost, and they had one focus, and there was the salvation of souls. And, and then there was unity in the church, keeping the main thing, the main thing. It's everybody unified to focus on one thing. Jesus and, and magnifying Jesus and, and lifting him up so that he has the opportunity to draw all men to himself. Uh, chapter 2, we talked about unity within the church. Chapter 3, we talked about the opportunities of the church as God has given us the opportunity to co-labor with him in the propagation of the gospel. Chapter 4, we talked about the first persecution and uh, uh, as... Uh, as Peter, Peter and John, um, they healed the man and then they were arrested at the time overnight. But we talked about that and preached a sermon on that. First persecution. Chapter 5, we talked about the attack from within. Ananias and Sapphira and the pride that they had in their lives. And God says, I do not tolerate pride. I hate pride. And, and God killed them. Uh, on the spot, I've not seen any, not saying that there, there, there are other places in the Bible where God killed people, but not like that and not in that way and not in that timing. I mean, and, and, they, and he killed them for lying and for tempting the Holy Ghost by taking their lie to the apostles and basically just said, the Holy Ghost will just have to deal with this. And the Holy Ghost said, no, I don't. So uh, those are the first five chapters and sermons. Today we're going to look at the first schism, the first problem. It was a schism in the church. Now look at chapter 6 and verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason um, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Or to, to handle this responsibility is what he meant. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the business, the business of uh, the ministering to the widows and the poor. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and uh, of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and uh, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and uh, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. The word of God, the ministry of the church, the power of God, the salvation of souls increased. Uh, after this, this schism, after this problem, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So, we're going to go back down through these verses here, and I got four points tonight. And uh, I don't know; it may it may end up being a little a uh, little more teachy than preachy. We'll see how that works out, but. But definitely valuable, valuable information here in Acts chapter 6. Now, uh, it talks about the first schism. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Holy Spirit of God, have your will and way. Empower me as a speaker and everybody that is hearing this and will hear it later, uh, even in different days and weeks to come. Uh, fill them with your power to, uh, 
to be changed because of thy word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The first verse tells us of two groups of people in the church, all right? Verse 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, okay? The Grecians uh, were, 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 were saved people. They had gotten saved, they, and they were Jews, right? They were Jews, and they were saved, but they spoke only Greek, all right? I'm going to read you something here that, uh, that I pulled out of a commentary. They are referred to as Hellenists by historians. Hellenists were specialists in the study of the Greek language, literature, culture, or history, or an admirer of the Greek culture and civilization. A person who adopted the Greek customs, language, and culture during the Hellenistic period especially a Hellenized Jew. The Hellenistic period, basically the period of time between uh, the death of Alexander the Great and really the full rising of the Roman Empire. During that period there would be called the Hellenistic period. And these were Jews, these were Jews that got saved, but they had an affinity for the Greek culture, the language, and, and, and literature, the history, they admired Greek culture and civilization. And they adopted Greek cult, uh, customs, language, and culture, and so forth. So that's the first group. Grecians, the Bible calls them Grecians. We could refer to them as Hellenist. All right, either one. The second group were the Hebrews. Now these were out and out Jews, dwelling largely in Jerusalem, observing all the customs of their religion, far more dedicated to the scriptures and living by them. So you have two groups of people in the church. They're members of the church. One are the Grecians who, 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 who enjoyed Greek culture, knew the Greek language, uh, um, the Greek literature. They were all about the Greek culture and everything about it. Then, um, then the uh, then you had the Hebrews, and these were out and out Hebrews. I mean, uh, you know, these were Jews, and they're all Jews, but these were Jews that were dedicated and committed uh, to the Scripture and living it out. In a conservative Baptist church, the two groups might be divided as liberals and conservatives. Grecians being the liberals. Being, being people that, that are saved, born again, church members, but that are, but that, are um, uh, that enjoy the culture of the world and enjoy the language of the world and enjoy all about the world, the culture, the history, the literature, the customs, you know, uh, that would be, that would, we would call those people liberal people. And then you had conservatives, hardliners, and you know they 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 read the Bible, studied the Bible, and uh, and practiced the Bible. Well, the Grecians had a problem, okay, and th this was a schism. It was a a split or division in the people, uh, two groups of people, you know, that disagree on a topic. So we're going to take a look at this today and see what we can learn from it in regards to our own churches here. Uh, verse 1, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians. We know who they are. Those were the liberals in the church, if you will, against the Jews, the dedicated, committed Jews. And, and they were all Jews, but against the Hebrews because their wid widows were neglected in the daily uh, ministration. Point number one, the progress of the church continues. In verse one, we see that, uh, that, that the souls are still being saved. The church is still after it. The church is still focused on the cause of Christ, the main thing, the main responsibility and activity of the church and concern is the cause of Christ and the church is still after it. So the, the, the progress of this church continues. The disciples were multiplied, meaning that people were still being saved. New converts were following in the footsteps of the apostles and becoming soul winners themselves and, and uh, becoming servants in the church. A and this is a sign of a healthy church. A healthy church will produce fruit in the form of converts. We often think a healthy church is a church that gives a lot of money. No, I can show you buildings out there, and I even hesitate to call them churches in this day and time, that have all the money in the world. 
but they're not healthy. They're sick because they are not doing the work of God. They are not, they are not after souls. And uh, there, there's nobody getting saved in them. Salvation is not uh, preached from behind the pulpits anymore. People are not coming down to the aisles, uh, down the aisles to the altar anymore to surrender, uh, to to beg and plead for the help of God and and to get saved and to make important decisions that ought to be made right down here at an altar. That's not happening. We got a lot of cold and dead churches out there in this world today. And they're filled with a lot of Grecian type people. They're saved, but they have, you know, but they just enjoy the culture of this world way too much. And uh, so the primary goal of the local New Testament church is to win souls. It has been harder to reach out to people during this time because of social distancing. And it's been a little bit harder to witness to people, but you can still pray for them. You can still give out tracts. And through your actions and through the goodness that you that you do to people, you can uh, uh, you can still do something good for them and hand them a track and, and invite them to your church. There are still ways to witness during this time. Now, I want to give you an example the other day of, uh, of a situation that, that was presented to me. And the Holy Spirit said, hey, here's an opportunity. I want to share this with you and just show you show you how that it's 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 easy. It's easy to get a conversation going. All right. Uh, I was out hitting some golf balls at Burkdale Golf Course. I was on the driving range and a man walked up to me in, in the position next to me, you know, the little area next to me. He was going to hit balls. And so uh, we greeted each other. It was in the afternoon. We greeted each other and. He had on UVA, had on a, United, a University of Virginia hat and coat. And I said, so, I, I know where your loyalty lies, and you're a cavalier. And he said, yeah, I have a son that graduated from there and, and uh, went on uh, in, 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 in the area of kinesiology. And, um, and I said, oh, that's awesome, man. And he said, yeah. He said, well, I have another son that graduated from Duke. He said, so, you know, last weekend... Uh, Duke and Virginia played. I said, well, who do you pull for when they play? And he said, well, I pull for Duke because Duke has more of my money. And I said, and this is the Holy Spirit, people, but I said, oh, so kind of like where your, where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. Now, that's a verse, that's a quote in, in the Bible out of uh, the Sermon on the Mount and uh, quoting Jesus there. And uh, But here's what I said. I said, oh, kind of like where your treasure is, there where your heart, and he went, he started shaking his head. He goes, yep, that's exactly what it is. That let me know right away that he was a believer. He knew that verse. He, he could have finished it for me, if you will. So I knew he was a believer. We chatted on for just a little while longer. Then I hit some more balls, and he did. Point is, it's so easy to get in a conversation if we're looking to. You know, it's just so easy to get into a conversation about the Lord if we're looking to. The problem is with churches these days and times, and even pastors and deacons and Sunday school teachers and, and lay people into pews, we're not looking for that conversation. Now, if you're really shy, you know, really shy, and I understand that, not everybody's going to, you know, God gives us different gifts, and He gives us gifts for different service in the church. Some people find it very easy to just open up a conversation like I did with that guy. Well, well, it should be. It should be for me. I mean, I'm a pastor, you know, and, and I have that gift. Some of you may not, but I'll tell you what everybody can do. Everybody can take a tract and just hand it to somebody and say, when you get time, read this. It'll tell you how you can spend eternity with God. Thank you. Have a good day. Now, everybody can do that. It may be hard the first time, but when you do it time after time after it'll get a lot easier for you. So, but but the progress of the church continues. We see it in verse one, and they were and they and, they, and this church was healthy, vibrant, growing. Point number two: uh, the problem which arose in the church, and that is also in voice in in, uh, in uh, verse one. And there arose murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. We have a problem here. Um, we see that even during times of success, problems can still arise. You know, you would think sometimes that, man, when the church is firing all cylinders and, and, um, 
and, and, and people and growing and people getting saved and lives are getting changed and people getting baptized and people surrendering to the Lord and serving the Lord in his church, you would think, man, how could, how could the great church at Jerusalem have a problem? How could it have a schism? Well, it did. And the schism was that the, the Grecians, the Hellenistic people, felt like that their widows were not being treated on an equal, on an equal level with the, 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 uh, with the Hebrews, uh, you know, the committed people. Uh, uh, you know, the, the people that, 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 that weren't, weren't Grecians. And so that was a schism. That was a problem. And the Grecians began to murmur. Now, that's a problem. That's a problem in life. That's a problem in church uh, is when people begin to murmur. Now, one reason people get murmur is because they weren't prepared for a problem. They weren't prepared for something to happen. They weren't prepared to handle. And I just want to talk very briefly here on that good lesson to be learned here. Prepare, prepare yourselves for problems. Prepare yourselves for problems. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't think it odd. I remember one time, years and years and years ago, somebody had lost a relative, and this was at college, and, and look, the person was falling apart. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this must have been a brother or sister, must have been a mom or dad. And this was a college-aged kid. And, uh, and I walked up and said, man, I heard, I, heard, uh, I heard you lost a relative. Yes. And I said, well, who was it? And the person, look, the person's falling apart. And it said it was my grandmother. And I'm like, oh, wow, how old was she? And the person said 103. Now, look, I'm not saying that that's not, you know, that, that, that a person dying at 103, I'm not saying that it's not, you know, that that's not going to have any effect. But I walked away thinking, what were you really expecting? And, you, and, and I walked away thinking you hadn't really prepared yourself for the death of your grandmother. And then when it hit you, it was just shocking. Well, it shouldn't be. And in 1 Peter there, God tells us that we shouldn't be shocked when, when troubles come into our lives. The Hellenists, I'm sorry, the Grecians, the Hellenists began to murmur. God hates murmuring. To murmur is to complain, which is never healthy in a relationship or an organization, or a church. God hates it. Study murmuring uh, in the Old Testament as Moses brought the people out of Egypt and in the desert and how they murmured and the actions that God took against the people that murmured and criticized uh, the leadership there. Study that sometimes. God hates it and he is not for it. And we need to be very careful. So this was a schism. Look, so, be, so when problems come, you need to be prepared. And I know we can't prepare for everything, but we need to just every day that we get up, just, just prepare and say things may not all go my way today. So that's, that's, more, that's more reason to walk with God this morning, to get in his word this morning, to get close to him this morning, to get in his presence this morning, so that the unforeseen things that do happen in our lives we're prepared, we're yielded, we're committed to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is definitely in control, leading us in the ways of godliness and righteousness. Now, point number three. So first you had the progress of the church. It's growing. It's just, it's just growing like crazy. And then the problem which arose in the church was a schism. And the, the Grecian says, you're not, you're not treating our widows fairly. You're not treating them as well as you're treating the Hebrew widows. And, uh, and we got a problem with that. All right, so then, point number three, the plan of the church. In verses two through six, then the 12 called the multitude, the 12 apostles called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, call the church together. They had a business meeting, if you will. Called the church together and said, it is not reason uh, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose, uh, uh, as we, I'm not going to, Stephen and a bunch of these other guys, Philip and some of these guys, I don't even know how to pronounce their names, but chose them seven men 
um, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. The plan of the church. The, the apostles were handling this duty. Okay. And they basically said, um, we, we can't spend. Okay. Obviously, we're not doing a very good job here. And uh, some people are upset and some people are murmuring. So we're, we're going we're gonna to organize a little bit better the church to address this need. And because we can't take any more time away from prayer and preparation and the ministry of the Word of God. And preachers, you know, preaching and, and ministering the Word of God and teaching. We can't take any more time away from that. So uh, we're going we're gonna to organize a little better. And, um, and they said, church you choose seven people uh, amongst you, and, uh, and we're going to give them this duty, this duty. And these are the first deacons. We're going to give to them this duty of ministering and doling out the money. And, and it's like here, we have a benevolence committee, and the benevolence committee is the deacons. So uh, this committee, they said, is going to care for these, these responsibilities. And, uh, and, it'll, and it will give us even more time. I think what the apostles realize is we're not doing a good job here because one group thinks that we're stiffing them and we're showing favoritism. You know, we're, we're, we're stiffing the group over here that we feel might be a little more liberal than we are the more committed disciples, you know, of, of, uh, of God and into the scriptures and studying and so forth. And uh, so something's happened and it must be in the way that we haven't in other words, it's kind of our fault. As leadership, it's kind of our fault. So, now, I'm going to stop right there and, 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 and address another important teaching. When criticized, first check for truth in the criticism. If there is any amount of truth, then that must be addressed. I have always had, when I coached basketball my very first year, a long time ago, up in Hammond, Indiana, I got a seven-page front and back letter from a parent and it was anonymous and I read the whole thing and uh, and I took it to the coach and they were just criticizing my coaching I took it to the head coach and I said I don't know what to do with this he said first thing if it's unsigned <coughs> don't worry about it <coughs> he said don't worry about it if the person doesn't have enough courage to sign your letter then don't worry about it then he said secondly look for criticism is there anything in this letter that could be true and I said, well, actually, you know, I, I think they have a couple good points. You know, if they have 50 criticisms, I could probably find two or three things in there that were, there were actually areas in which I need to work. He said, then take it and, and, and don't worry about the things uh, that you're not convicted of and work on the things that the Holy Spirit's revealing to you. And maybe you got a problem in this area. So when people criticize us, the first thing we should do instead of lashing out at them and beating them down is to take the criticism in, find a quiet place and pray over it and say, are they right? And if they are right, then we need to address those areas and we need to improve those areas. And that's exactly what, um, what the apostles did. They weren't, apparently they weren't doing a good enough job of ministering uh, the funds and the money um, because of time constraints. So instead of, instead of blasting the Grecians for murmuring and complaining and, and sowing discord in the church and causing a schism or a divide in the church, they said, no, we need to get better organized here. And, uh, and I, I, I look, I have looked at that and continue to look at it uh, weekly, if not daily, how I can better organize my life, how I can better organize the church to... to um, you know, to, to where we don't where we don't allow schisms in our church and division in our church, but and listen to this: the stronger person will seek to take responsibility for the problems whenever they are part of the problem. Read that. Let me quote it again. And uh, the stronger person will take responsibility for their problem whenever they are part of the problem. The stronger person says, let's meet, let's talk about this, let's find a solution, uh, you know, let's get this right. And uh, the stronger people, being apostles, just drew all the church together and said, hey, there's a problem here and it's a lack of organization, we're kind of at fault, but we can't take any more time away from prayer and Bible study, so we're gonna, you're gonna elect seven men 
seven men to fulfill this responsibility and handle it. I'm editing here as I go. Uh, so, and here's what they did. Here's what the church did. They chose seven of the Grecians. They so chose seven of the Grecians. They couldn't speak the language. They spoke Greek. But they were people that were full of the Holy Ghost, had a good reputation, and were wise. So of the crowd of the Grecians that were maybe more liberal, they found seven men, you know, that, that, that spoke Greek, but really, but really uh, was more committed, you know, uh, like, like the Hebrews were, like the out and out the true Hebrews were. Now, the as disciples, uh, the apostles didn't say, hey, that ain't going to work. You know, didn't say that. Uh, didn't say, no, you got to choose, you know, maybe four of you and three from this group. They didn't say that. They said, fine, you're the one that had the complaints. Uh, we'll give you the authority. You want to bring seven of, 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 your, of your people in. That's fine with us because they do have a good report. They are uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and they are wise people. So we will trust them to serve in this capacity in the church in the hand of excuse me, handling of the money and the, uh, uh, like the benevolence committee, if you will. And uh, so, and there, there, there's a lesson there. Uh, sometimes we need to yield our preferences. Everything does not have to be done our way, folks. And, uh, and I, as a pastor, you'd be surprised as a pastor uh, at how many times that I just yield. I, I just look at a topic, I look at an issue, I look at maybe even a problem, and I may have a preference but I just yield it because it's not worth fighting over. It's not worth having discord. It's not worth having a schism in the church, a problem in the church, a division in the church. It's not worth it. So just yield. You know, some people, look, some people don't like the, the colors that we chose for our church here. But, you know, some of those people that have come up and told me after they've seen it, they say, well, look, I, I, I voted. You know, I did. I wasn't for it, but I voted for it you know, just yielding preference. I voted for it, even though I wasn't really for it, and now I really love it. Yield preferences, folks. We've got to keep the main thing, the main thing in a church. The main thing is Jesus Christ, the cause of Christ, the winning of souls, the discipling of souls, to teach them to win other people. That's the main thing. And, uh, and the apostles said, we're not fighting over this. Yeah, we made a problem. You're probably right. So we're going to turn it over to you, let you deal with it. Then they, uh, they called, the seven people came together, and the apostles uh, prayed for them, laid their hands on them. And they actually, what the apostles said is the authority that's been given to us to run the church, we are going to, you know, we're going to give that authority to this group of men in, you know, in this area to handle this uh, to handle this, uh, this, th this type of business of the church. And uh, so the authority came from God to the apostles, and the apostles uh, 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 yielded it, that authority, to this group of men to do that job. And uh, so, so, so we look at this. So that's the problem. That's how they handle it. First, you had the progress of the church, the problem which arose in the church, the schism, the murmuring, the complaining. Then you had the plan of the church. It's what the apostles said we're going to do to fix the problem. That way people are, are, can move on again and uh, can get back, in the, get back in, the, in, in, in the saddle. You know, get back at the business of winning souls and uh, getting people out of hell. Then the fourth point, and we're just about done here. The fourth point is the power of the church. And in verse 7. Um, chapter 6, verse 7. Let me get back to it. And the word of God increased. It increased more than it had in verse 1. I already said disciples were multiplied. Um, so the church was having success. Well, it had more success. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. 
A lot of priests got saved. And not the evil priests, probably not many of them, but priests that had a heart for God, but, it, but just couldn't figure this thing out about Jesus and hadn't accepted him. A lot of them started to get saved uh, after this time. The power of the church grew. The influence of the church grew. More people started getting saved and more, more uh, the, the, the uh, people getting saved was multiplied. The power of the church grew. Because of the wise handling of a problem. They say, and I think this is true, and I've broken several bones, but they say if you break your arm, that place where the bone grows back together, they say that, that's, that your arm won't break there again, or at least it's harder to break where the bone grew back together than it would be a different place in your arm. They say that like Elmer's glue and type good types of good, now reputable, good types of wood glue, you can glue two pieces of wood together, and if you let it cure appropriately, that if you go to tear them apart, it will not break where the glue is. It'll break at a different part in the wood, but not where the glue is. So when we have problems in the church, when we have schisms in the church, when we have issues in the church, when we have a divide in the church, the best thing we can do is get people together, maybe organize a little bit better, and get through it and get over it and make it right and get back in the saddle, get back on track of winning souls to Christ. And this church became more powerful after having dealt with this issue. So when we, and look, our church here, Clover Hill Baptist, if we have issues in the church, let's not, let, let's not murmur and criticize and let them fester and become a big wound. Let's get them out in the open, go to the appropriate people that have the authority in a certain area, you know, where you think something wrong is being done or not handled right. Go to that person and, uh, or to those people, you know, or to the pastor. Anybody can come to me and just say, I got this problem. We'll talk it out. We'll fix it. We'll, we'll, we'll get things right again so that we can get rid of the divide. We cannot be divided. Unity, unity. Uh, look, division grieves the Holy Ghost. Flat out. We've already talked about it, and we'll talk about it more in the future. Division grieves the Holy Ghost, and he cannot work the way that he would. It shackles him. It, it ties him up. Unity, unity um, brings power. Uh, you know, it releases the Holy Ghost. Okay, look, I hesitated there. It's because somebody turned one of the lights off in here. So I want you to know, I'm not losing my mind. Somebody turned a light off in here and it distracted me. Unity unshackles the Holy Spirit, take, cuts the binders off of him, and he is, allowed to, uh, he is allowed to work and powerfully, influentially. And we will see the, the work of the church increasing. As often is the case, relationships that can survive problems become stronger, become stronger. May we learn from uh, Acts chapter 6 uh, that, that issue and uh, that, that teaching there and how to handle problems wisely and taking responsibility for problems and uh, keeping the church unified uh, through organization, more organization and working through issues. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the teaching of Acts 6. So, so important. I'm enjoying so much our time in Acts, and I pray that our people are, and anybody viewing this is, uh, Holy Spirit of God, do your work in our lives. And if we're, if we're, Holy Spirit, if we're struggling, if we have issues, help us to find the people that can correct the issue and, and take the problem to them. And, um, and let's fix issues, not, not let them fester and compound Let's, uh, let's get them fixed. Let's get them worked out. Let's fix it and let's keep move, moving forward, focused and unified on one goal. And that is the salvation of souls and building the kingdom of, of the Lord on this earth. Building the kingdom of God on this earth. We love you. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Well, God bless you. Take that and to learn from that tonight as I have learned uh, in my preparations. Good information, good teaching, good truth for us. 
uh, have a great have a great uh, the rest of your day today and a wonderful week. Glorify the Lord in all things, uh, in every way that you live your life. Uh, praying, ask, ask, uh, accessing his presence uh, in every area of life. All right. Thank you for joining us. God bless you.